Good afternoon. Welcome to the panel session on scenarios and OR in the stream of application in strategic issues. Uh, while we wait everybody to connect, um, I will just uh, simply talk a little bit. Um, so far, I can see that we have 37 participants, 38 participants. I will wait a couple of more minutes and see if we get perhaps a little bit more. So the idea of the panel is basically to have the three different perspectives about the use of the scenarios in, in events or after the events like COVID-19 or to predict this type of events. And the idea of this panel is on how to, to share different perspective. I think one of the interesting thing with the scenarios um, area is that there are m multiple approaches and, and perspective on, on that area. So it's, it's, it will be quite interesting to have this, this different um, perspective uh, during today. Um, just to introduce myself, my name is Martin Kung. I'm uh, at Southampton Business School and I will be the chair of the panel. So let's see, we have so far 46 participants. So if each of you wants to um, share your detail, perhaps you can write your name and where are you working or your, or your area in the chat function. So then uh, you can see uh, who are uh, attending the, 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 the stream and perhaps later on you can find them in the networking session. So, um, and just to start with the formal process, um, you can see on the top right, uh, right corner, a red box. This is the, the place where you can put all the videos. So when you see the speaker, right? And if you reduce the speaker to only one person, um, you, can, you can place it there so it will not interfere with, with the content of the slides and that can be um, quite useful for you. Um, use the chat function to send messages but right, rather than raising your hand because we don't want to stop the, the flow of the, of the presentations. And you can also use the Q&A uh, function as each of the speakers will speak if you have uh, specific questions and then we are going to deal with all the questions after their presentations. Um, so it will be plenty of time, approximately 25 minutes for Q&A. So um, it will be good that you um, raise those questions. One thing that we can do is that as you are seeing different questions, if you feel that the questions can also identify your, 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 your problem, perhaps you can vote for that question. So those questions that have the higher votes will be the ones that we will ask first. And when you ask a specific question to a panelist, try to put the name first. So if it's George, James or John, you can, you can um, add that. Uh, during the presentation, there, there will not be a series of polls, so you don't have to worry about that. And after the um, conference, you will have uh, this, the video of the session available in the OR website. So being uh, more, uh, just to start uh, the, the session, we have three very um, interesting panelists. George Wright from the Strathclyde Business School, James Derbyshire from Middlesex University Business School, and John Moorcroft from London Business School. As I said before, my name is Martin Kunk. I'm from Southampton Business School. The idea of this panel is somehow to reflect on what has been going on uh, with COVID and somehow as, as a question perhaps for, for, for using a scenario in OR and using the scenario by itself is that you can see that the scenario has, has quite a successful trajectory predicting different crises, but it seems to be that we, we didn't discuss more uh, much about the pandemic as in, in the scenarios. I, at least that's my, my recollection. So 
The idea is each of the panelists will try to answer these two questions uh, before opening the discussion to participants. The question one is what is the role of scenarios in events like this one, like COVID-19 on crisis, when we are in the middle of the crisis? How, how can the scenarios help the decision makers to visualize the next steps uh, after the, the or during the crisis? And the question two is can the scenarios predict events like COVID-19? So can this tool help us to see this, this type of, of events? So, Please keep your microphone on mute and make questions through the chat. And we'll, I will start first with um, George um, Wright um, answering these two questions. So George, if you want to start, I will stop sharing so you can start talking. Okay, Martin, thank you very much indeed. Um, I've got 12 minutes, my understanding is, so I'll touch on a few issues. Uh, which may generate some, some thought. So Martin's first question is, you know, what is the role of scenarios developed in response to COVID-19? The first thing, of course, is to think about what a scenario is. And of course, uh, it's an external context about what's going on in the world in some way. It's a narrative. Um, it's a, a plausible uh, and often systematized set of scenarios. Often there are four, there are different ways of developing scenarios. It's a practitioner derived approach in the main, and there are many different, sort of different, slightly different ways of doing it within that. Um, but they are narratives. They are about the external world, you know, the pestel environment, political, economic, social, technological change, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's a broad brush picture of the future. And often I say there are about four of them. Now, why do people use scenarios? Well, mostly, well, we sort of, from the literature, three things emerge. One is, to understand the causality of uh, the way things the future might involve. So understanding and enhancing our understanding of causal processes, how one thing leads to another, like dominoes falling in a, a particular direction. But remember, there are probably several directions up to four different ways a dominoes could fall with four you know, quite distinct futures, but each with a, a causality underpinning it that's understandable and plausible. Another look at the objective of scenario interventions is challenging conventional thinking. So rather than just be a best guess future, there's a range of futures that are plausible, uh, understandable and challenging that make the decision maker think, well, the, the future could be different from the way things are now. It's not just an extrapolation. It could be very different. And I understand why the causal processes, etc. And the third objective of, of most interventions is trying to improve decision making in some way. So it might be evaluating options against the scenarios to see how robust they are, or um, it might be trying to improve the decision-making in a group in, in some way. So let's look at what's happening with COVID-19. Uh, and Megan Crawford, who, who I work with and working with now, we're, we're currently looking at what we call the mass production of scenarios in response to COVID-19. So in 2019, before the uh, the epidemic, the pandemic, there were about five scenarios produced about pandemics. Since June uh, or March, June uh, 2020, there are about 350, 350 scenario sets. So it's been a mass production. Uh, they're often very reactive. Um, they're often bleak futures. Again, we're analyzing this at the moment. Uh, they're mostly short term, five years out. Um, and most of them, or not, well, some of them at least, have been produced by the major consultancies. You know, KPMG, etc. Why are they doing this question? Well, maybe to try and generate some business in developing scenarios for particular industries or organizations. The key thing to note about this is that the scenario has been built under a time of stress and threat. And that's often the case with scenario thinking without the pandemic, but in organizations, when things start to go wrong, people tend to do scenarios because they're trying to think about things at that point. Often they're not done any other way. So Megan and I are looking at these scenario sets. Uh, they tend mainly to be general purpose, broad, fish, broad brush pictures of the future. They tend to be you know, four or so, uh, fairly extreme. Some of them are just sensitivity analyses, up and down 10%, but, but quite a few are fairly extreme. And mostly they are about the downside, how things can go worse, perhaps. Some of them involve these interactions between causality and across the pestel dimensions, politics, economics, social change, technological change, etc. Um, 
but very, very few of them involve the self-interested actions of powerful stakeholders. And powerful stakeholders in the COVID case, for instance, are governments and uh, citizens. So both governments and citizens can take actions to enhance their own interests within an unfolding scenario storyline. Um, and the new twist then on scenarios that's in the literature is very much looking at the powerful players, how they react to unfolding events within scenarios and therefore change the course perhaps of the future. And you can imagine governments perhaps, you know, enforcing lockdowns or not enforcing lockdowns, citizens, you know, uh, being locked down or, or choosing not to be locked down. And these, of course, will affect the way the future unfolds. But very few of these, these scenario sets that have been developed for 300 plus involve these agency, the local actions of powerful stakeholders. Um, often the scenario sets are also produced, uh, you know, uh, by consultants or, or small teams or, or just one person, rather than involving affected communities to get them involved in actually producing the, the components of the scenario to think about the causality. Often also there's not a reality check of the scenarios with people who, who, who know, you know a bit more perhaps about what's going on. So many of the scenarios then perhaps aren't that good, even though there are 300 plus. And so what we're doing currently is, is trying to analyze those. Um, the other twist that, that happens a lot now in scenarios that, that aren't incorporated in many of these scenarios is actually incorporating forecasts, you know, projections, point projections of quantitative variables within the scenarios. So for instance, in the energy industry currently uh, about the energy transition, people can make forecasts of say heat pump take up or electric car take up within different scenarios. And this is a, a brand new twist really on the scenario method, uh, combining scenarios, anticipating a different range of broad futures with a forecasting context. Um, so that's true about what's happening. And also currently many of these scenario sets have been developed, haven't been focused on strategy development or option evaluation. They are just broad pic brush pictures of the future. So the key question then is for anybody involved in these scenarios is the degree to which maybe they, they could involve or should involve affected groups, uh, organizations and communities that are affected by the scenarios and to make them part of the scenario development process and also to anticipate the actions they could take or evaluate the actions they could take to try and achieve a future that to them is a good future. And again, that's something that probably needs to be more times to be spent on. So it's possible then in building scenarios, and this has been done outside the COVID context, to involve the participant of, of effective, participation of affected citizens, perhaps who aren't that powerful, but yet can identify and activate powerful stakeholders to take their position, to, to support them in achieving a future that they want as the, the overall contextual environment uh, evolves. And another way of, of, of focusing on the scenarios and, and, and developing the scenario process is in fact to involve the powerful in the scenario development process. So not producing scenarios that are produced for the powerful, but involve the powerful in the scenario process. So it's their view of the future, and also they can articulate, if it's, a, if it's an agency approach with, with several powerful stakeholders, articulate their own actions to achieve what they'd all like within the futures that they are uh, thinking through. So the scenarios that have been developed in COVID then tend to be broad brush, you know, sort of arm's length scenarios away from the, the real, you know, the affected citizens, the affected stakeholders, and away from the powerful and away from a decision-making context. So that's, that's problematic with it. The other important issue to note that scenario planning as it stands or scenario thinking as we tend to call it now, is not that dynamic. It's not dynamic. People, you know, even Shell do it maybe once or twice a year or Singapore government do this, you know, uh, several times a year. But if, if things are unfolding in a very perhaps unpredictable way, you know, new changes each time like lockdowns, immunity, second waves, vaccines being, all this needs to be perhaps incorporated in views of an unfolding future. And scenarios really aren't set out to be that dynamic. They tend to be a bit more, bit more static. Um, so that's my sort of general answer to the first question. Moving on now to the second question and checking my timing on about nine minutes now, so I've got a few minutes left. Can scenarios predict events such as COVID-19? Well, the first thing to note is, of course, that scenarios aren't about prediction. They're about anticipation, anticipating a range of plausible, but yet very disparate futures. Uh, and 
the, the other thing to note, of course, is the 300 scenarios COVID have been post-COVID. They've been reactive scenarios rather than anticipatory. Only about a handful have been anticipatory. So scenarios are not, not about prediction, especially point prediction, unless, of course, the forecasting is, is involved and incorporated in the scenario process. So if you're interested in really anticipating events and you're interested in judgment rather than using a time series or historic information, then you really need a different technique, which is called Delphi. And Delphi is about using a group and their judgment in, a, in an interactive way to produce a group forecast, group-based forecast of a quantitative variable. And so that's about prediction, really, rather than anticipation of a, a range of different futures. So I was going to say, the scenarios then have a purpose. Uh, I don't think they've been fully uh, used as they could have been powerfully within the, uh, the, uh, the COVID setting. Um, I'm involved currently with a range of scenario activities, one for the Glasgow Economic Recovery uh, Council, looking at the futures for Glasgow City region. And one of the scenarios we developed, and we gave it a title called Vegetative State. Vegetative state, because you can imagine in that worst case scenario, the, 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 the pandemic doesn't go away and people have no money to spend anyway. You can imagine that sort of state, not just Glasgow City, but many cities across the world will be in a vegetative state. So there we are, Martin, that's my sort of brief run through, and I think I'm Perfect. well within the, uh, the 12 minutes. And I'll hand back to you, Martin. Yes, perfect timing. Thank you, George. So I'm, now I'm going to uh, move the, the, the opportunity, I'm going to give the opportunity to James. Um, first, I'm going to uh, put the slides. James, can you see the slides? I can see them. Thank you very much, Martin. Yes. Okay. And let me, let me, uh, okay. This is the first slide. Okay. So I'm James Derbyshire from Middlesex University. Um, oh, there you go. Just to build slightly, but not intentionally on what George said, um, in relation to scenarios not being used for prediction purposes. Um, my, my viewpoint when I saw the question that we were supposed to respond to was that that's, that's true, but we don't need scenarios anyway to predict pandemics. I think one of the sad, the sad things about COVID-19 is that a global pandemic wasn't really very uncertain. It was certain at some point. So we don't need a scenarios to predict COVID-19, but we do need scenario planning to prepare for them. And COVID-19 or a global pandemic of this type was very much a known possibility. It was a known known. Um, so for example, I've looked, had a look at the World Economic Forum's Global Risk Report and the 2000, 2019 report, which is published in January 15th, 2019, a very large amount of that report discusses the possibility of a pandemic and the report also suggests that pandemics are increasing in frequency and severity and that countries around the world are woefully underprepared for them and indeed speaking to one of my colleagues about this Dilik Onkel um, she informed me that this same global risk report published by the World Economic Forum has um, published I think at least since at least 2007 has highlighted uh, a global pandemic as a major risk. So in that respect, it's a known known. I would associate scenario planning more with uncovering known unknowns or even unknown unknowns. And therefore, we, it's scenario planning is not something that we need to predict them. We know they're going to happen at some point, but we do need scenario planning to prepare for them. Because while they're inevitable at some point, the probability of a pandemic in any one year or let's say in any government planning period is quite low and a problem is that decision and policy makers would tend to overlook small probabilities when they're preparing for the future and planning so we need scenario planning to make these small tail probabilities if we can call them that loom larger in the minds of decision makers and policy makers in order that they actually prepare for them. So the very, act, the very act of writing a scenario, a narrative scenario, may make a tail event with a small probability loom larger in the minds of participants. So, you know, their, the perceived probability is increased 
and therefore they are more likely to prepare for this for that particular scenario so I, I see scenario planning as a, having a role in preparation more so than prediction if we can move to the next slide I think one of the things that um, one of the things that what George was saying highlighted is there there are many different understandings and definitions of scenario planning. De you know, I, I've spoken to people because I'm originally from a forecasting background. I've spoken to people who use the phrase scenario planning when they're doing something much more akin to what I would call sensitivity analysis. That you know they're running a model, they're changing the inputs to a small degree. And then running the model again and seeing what the difference is in the outcome, which I would call sensitivity analysis. Scenario planning in the, let's say, intuitive logics tradition is very different from that. Um, but depending on how you define scenario planning, you can actually, there's an argument that scenario planning was detrimental in the case of COVID-19 because it inhibited the immediate invoking of the precautionary principle, which is a, a principle central to risk analysis. So one of the criteria for invoking the precautionary principle is if there is no accurate model available and the, the threat is potentially exponential or systemic as it was in this case. So instead of immediately invoking the precautionary principle, which would have entailed a lockdown, an immediate lockdown, the UK government in collaboration with Imperial College spent time doing epidemic diffusion modeling. Okay. If you look at the account in nature by Adam, uh, there was a key, a key parameter in this modelling, which was the pr proportion of people admitted to hospital needing ICU treatment, which turned out to be double what it was assumed to be in the modelling. It turned out to be 30% rather than 15%. And that had major implications for the number of people who would need ICU treatment and the health service would be overwhelmed, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. When this was realised, it caused the change in policy from what people have been calling herd immunity to lockdown, but only belatedly. So. The point I'm trying to make is if we can call that scenario planning what they did there rather than sensitivity analysis or something else, then their attempt to engage in that scenario planning has caused them, rather than invoking the precautionary principle immediately and locking down, has caused them to delay. Um, you know, if that parameter was so uncertain, that key parameter, any modeling evidence should really have been ignored and the precautionary principle immediately invoked, leading to an immediate lockdown. So the modelling was misleading because of the high level of parameter uncertainty. So in this, if, if we can call that scenario planning, it's actually acted in a detrimental way in this case by causing a delay. Um, so if we can move to the next slide, which is related to that subject. So I did a paper in 2014 with George on anti-fragility, which is a concept from um, of Nassim Nicholas Taleb from his Inserto trilogy. Uh, I'm thinking specifically about this anti-fragile approach to scenario planning, which we set out in that paper. An, an implication of anti-fragility is that optimization and efficiency lead to fragility within a particular system. And one of the things that um, Taleb highlights when setting out anti-fragility is that buffering and redundancy are the friend of anti-fragility. Okay. Buffering and redundancy are one of the ways in which you would achieve an anti-fragile outcome. And we see this in relation to the issues associated with personal protective equipment in the pandemic. So they, it appears that they had a system that was driven by supply chain efficiency and supply chain optimization in relation to personal protective equipment. That's fine. It may, it may save you money in the short term, but when there's a, a a major event like a pandemic, it causes fragility in the system, it causes the system to break. Also in anti-fragility, there's an asymmetry in payoff. Payoff is, is convex. So the downside of any particular strategy or scenario has a cutoff point, whereas the gains are potentially exponential. You, you can see this in COVID-19 in relation to lockdown. So We've just spoken about the precautionary principle and whether they should have just immediately invoked that or not. So if if you invoke a lockdown and it proves to be unnecessary, you've not lost that much really. You've lost a little bit of economic output. And that's it. 
you can always cancel the lockdown. But if it proved to have been necessary but was not implemented fast enough, the resulting lost lives because of the exponential nature of a pandemic increases for a long time. And it's very, you're playing catch up from then on and it's very difficult to control the outbreak. So there's an asymmetry of payoff in anti-fragility, which we see in relation to lockdown in COVID-19. If you don't take account of this asymmetry in a pandemic situation, you're guaranteeing a large loss of life, which is, we've seen. So I would characterize not locking down as a crucial decision, as Shackle put it. I've looked at Shackle's work in some detail in one of my other papers on potential surprise theory. It was a crucial decision because it irreversibly changed the decision landscape. Retrospectively, locking down cannot have the same effect as locking down early. There's an asymmetry. And if we move to our final slide, please. Will COVID-19 raise the prominence and use of scenario planning? I think there is an opportunity for scenario planning to gain in prominence and to become more mainstream. I think at least in acad academic circles, it's still peripheral to the mainstream. I think it, it can become a standard tool for forcing decision makers to consider the possibility of tail events or events for which there is no meaningful probability. And of course, it can become prominent in considering how such events may play out once they've occurred. But then I, I take on board everything that George said about scenarios created under that context, kind of like react, very reactive, very scenarios which are created immediately after something's happened can often be of poor quality because they're kind of rushed out, etc. But I think in order to become a much more prominent mainstream tool, scenario planning needs more empirical research on the effect on individuals and their perception of uncertainty from different scenario approaches. There's a huge number of different scenario approaches. There's, a, there's at least 30, there's probably a lot more than that if you count the augmentations, etc. There are new ones coming online all the time. People are publishing papers suggesting new approaches all the time. Very few of them have received any empirical testing. So we don't really know what their effect is on people's perception of uncertainty. But related to that, scenario planning also needs better theoretical foundations. It, it had very practical origins. That's one of the reasons why its theoretical foundations are, are not very well developed. But I would also say the lack of strong theoretical foundations reflects the eclecticism of practical method, which is related to the lack of empiricism on whether any of these techniques work. So these two things, uh, uh, the need for stronger theoretical foundations and the need for more empirical research and scenario planning are related. So we're doing a project, uh, a SAMS and BAM funded project on scenario planning, which we'll use some randomized control trials to understand the effect of a type of scenario planning on individuals' perception of uncertainty. I'm doing that with my colleagues at Middlesex University, Mandeep Darmin, Ian Belton, and Dilik Onkel from Northumbria University. So look out, from, look out for the findings from that project. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, James. Very, very timely. <laughs> okay, good. That's brilliant, thank you. So our next speaker, so remember, if you have questions for the different presentations, try to put them in the chat and say the name of the presenter that you want to ask before we open the floor for questions. So our last panelist is John Walcroft. So yeah, is uh, his presentation. John? Okay, Martin, I'm here. And I'm not seeing myself at the present on the screen. Okay, well, let me um, get started here. It's a pleasure to be here with you on Zoom this afternoon, have an opportunity to contribute to this uh, discussion of the role of simulations and also scenarios in um, 
in, uh, in, in, in events like COVID-19. Um, let me explain how I'm coming at these two questions. My, I had done quite a lot of work on uh, scenarios with the Royal Dutch Shell Group. Um, and um, what I'm going to do, therefore, is to tackle these questions from the point of view of seeing what happened with developing models and simulators for the oil industry and the kind of discoveries that were made there and what that might have to say about the situation we face with uh, COVID-19. So, Martin, if you can move on to the next slide. First of all, just a few comments about the nature of scenarios in general. Um, as George ha has said, um, these are alternative futures. Um, there isn't one single future we're trying to look at, and they're not predictions. Um, but one of the, the, the key features with scenarios is they need to be plausible and persuasive. Plausible in the sense of whatever the assumptions that lie behind the thinking are believable. And persuasive is an interesting one to think about. You know, many of the scenarios generated by the Shell scenario planners were persuasive because they were vivid narratives brought to life in a very sort of visual way. Um, persuasive can also be um, because the story you tell over time is internally consistent um, and is, has a kind of clear reason behind it. And that, I think, is where um, simulations have a particular role to play. Connecting, I think, with what James had said, um, it seems to me that for COVID-19, generating scenarios in that situation is actually easier than it was for the oil industry, at least if you're dealing with the epidemiology um, of the spread of the disease. And I just wanted to say a little bit more about that. So if we move on to the <clears throat> next slide, to say a few words about structure, scenarios, and surprises. So here is an image that's quite often used in the feedback systems thinking area of a situation which is unfolding. And <clears throat> for us taking the overview here in this picture, the consequences are clear because there's a kind of structure there that we can see, even though the seated um, individual there uh, clearly has no clear sense of what is likely to unfold here. So often, if we just move to the next two images, Martin, The situation we find ourselves in is one where we're really not aware of the structure that's there. And therefore, when something gets set in motion, then you know, surprises come along, which if you're only able to get the overview of the situation, you might have been able to anticipate some of these things. Now, in the case of the oil industry, I think <clears throat> there have been genuine surprises uh, that have come along over the years. Um, and there have been genuine insights into those situations that avoided them being surprises. And I'll sort of explain a little bit more about that um, in the next couple of slides. But before I go on to that, um, I just want to make the point, I think, that for COVID-19, um, the structure of the situation is one that is actually rather well understood. Um, and there are very well-defined models and simulators that will give you some insight into what is likely to unfold over time. So that's the sense in which I think that COVID-19, at least the epidemiological aspects of it, um, are much more predictable than the oil industry. But let me take a look at the oil industry and some of the things that have been recognized and discovered there as a basis for thinking more about this issue of structure and surprises. So next slide, please, Martin. For a long, long period of time, um, the oil industry was worthwhile or usefully could be thought of in terms of a set of commercial oil producers who were interacting with the market and with consumers. 
So here's a sort of basic structure which applied really at, since the end of the Second World War and right through to the 1970s, that this was quite a, a reasonable way of describing what was going on in the industry. Um, so here, no, I, I don't need the extra one yet, Martin. Here we have oil price coming from the consumers in the market and influencing what commercial producers choose to do. So if oil demand is rising, because say there's growth in the economy, then oil price will go up. Commercial oil producers will begin to expand capacity, although this takes time, and eventually oil production comes online and begins to satisfy that extra demand that's coming through the system. Um, in feedback systems thinking term, that is a balancing feedback process, which can balance supply and demand sometimes with fluctuations along the way. Now, one of the important insights that I think came out of Shell's work in this area, not to begin with, with models and simulators, but in the vivid narratives they were able to create, was the recognition that that set of what had previously been commercial oil producers might end up breaking into two major different categories. So next image, please, Martin. And it was the realization before it had actually happened that a group of producers of the kind that ultimately became OPEC could come into existence in this previously commercially operated industry. And that was a wonderful insight to have that before it actually took place. So that the OPEC producers were actually behaving differently than typical commercial oil producers. They weren't just responding to oil price. They were looking at other things and they had other considerations in mind when under doing, undertaking capacity expansion and also when setting quotas. And that led, I think, to a whole series of useful insights that were possible to take around the organization and begin to get people in the company prepared for that possible future world. Um, and that's the situation where it was possible to provide useful insight in advance into the changing structure of the oil industry and also to prepare key decision makers in the industry to deal with that future, whatever aspect of the business they were involved in, whether it be the upstream or whether it might be the downstream retailing businesses, which would be affected differently by these different assumptions that you would uh, make here. So subsequently though, having made that kind of realization, there was a whole set of work done developing simulators within this structure. And that work showed that actually the way that the OPEC producers work can be quite varied and quite surprising in some respects over long periods of time. And moreover, in terms of that question I raised about what of this stuff is predictable versus genuine surprises, I think the oil industry has all along been a mixture of these things. There was discovery of this rise of the OPEC producers, then really trying to work out what OPEC producers would be able to do over time in the industry over long periods of time. But then even within that framework, major surprises coming along, like nobody had foreseen the rise of Russian oil um, and the fall of communism. That didn't really feature in any of the thinking, either in the modeling or the, or the, uh, or the other uh, sorts of uh, narratives that were developed. Uh, secondly, the appearance of, um, of oil, uh, additional oil coming from shale um, was something also that came as a big surprise um, in the industry, even though shale oil had been known about for a very long period of time. So those sort of surprises came along, eventually got incorporated into some of these models. And I now want to just move to the next slide and take a look at a couple of them scenarios um, here that look at a you know, reasonably contemporary period of time where some of these surprises have been incorporated 
into the models and uh, just to see some of the role that um, producers like OPEC can play here. So on the left hand side, here we have uh, oil price shown in the red trajectory over a period from 2010 to 2034. Um, if you can remember back to 2010, oil price was sky high, well over $100 per barrel. Um, and this simulated scenario shows one possible future unfolding over time and a really quite dramatic uh, set of trajectories for oil production on the right hand side in millions of barrels per day. So the red line represents the oil production by the commercial producers. And the other two lines, the blue and the black, represents production by uh, the different members of OPEC who are divided into two different categories, a so-called opportunist producers and swing producer. And what you see in this particular scenario, is starting from that sky high oil price, invokes what was called in the industry a shale gale. Commercial producers expand enormously <clears throat> for a long period of time and then gradually go into a steady decline over a period of 20 years or so. And this is a major change in the makeup of the industry and the key different producers and I think a possibility um, that is always there in the oil industry that the commercial producers can be and squeezed out gradually over time if OPEC producers choose to use their power to do so, which is not actually the, the power to raise price, but the power to gain market share. So that was a kind of set of insights into the possible, one possible plausible future for the industry over time, which comes from a relatively um, compact simulation model that incorporates both structure and the retrospect of surprises. So if we move on to the next slide, Martin, brings me back to the question of the role of models and simulators in, in the COVID uh, era. And I want to begin really with a question about modeling and realism. Um, and if you like a spectrum of model fidelity, you know, how much do you need to have in your model to engage people in a useful discussion about alternative futures? And simulators come in a variety of fidelities. There are high fidelity simulators with a lot of accurate detail like aircraft flight simulators. And on the other hand, engaging simulators are much, much smaller scale, low fidelity simulators um, and my favorite example of this is a Romeo and Juliet simulator that has been devised for high school students to draw them into thinking about Shakespeare's play. Um, now, the intriguing thing with that simulator is it has only four concepts in it. It has Romeo's love for Juliet, Juliet's love for Romeo, and the rate of change of their love for each other. And of course, that doesn't represent what's in Shakespeare's play by any means fully, but it turns out to be enough to engage many students to think hard about the, involving, the evolving relationships you might get among two lovers. So another way of thinking about that scale is the difference between analog, illustrative and metaphorical models. So on the left-hand side here, we have we actually have analog. We're only supposed to have analog. The slide is actually currently showing metaphorical um, displaced slightly. So if I can interpret this slide. Um, on the left hand side, high fidelity simulator is an analog simulator. In the middle are illustrative simulators of smaller size but nevertheless somehow connected realistically to the real world situation and on the right hand side if the positioning of that phrase was correct would be metaphorical simulators like Romeo and Juliet simulator. Now the grey region that I'm showing in there is really I think where most simulators reside. They're 
they can cover quite a broad range of many system dynamics models in particular lie towards the lower fidelity end of the scale, although not always. Um, and it's interesting to try and populate this um, picture with the range of different simulators that have been developed for COVID-19. So one that I think falls in the, in the realm of being an analog high fidelity type of simulator is one that has been developed by Columbia University. It's a very vivid spatial simulator, um, agent-based type representation that has been used really quite successfully to formulate pandemic control policies. Within the system dynamics arena, we can move to the next image, there's been a whole range of system dynamics models that have been developed in the past few months, um, ranging from those that are quite detailed through to those that are much more illustrative and smaller scale. Many of those models, though, if we just move to the next image, um, build on the basic SIR model and simulator to explore aggregate pandemic growth dynamics. And I think it is worth saying just a few words about that aggregate model. Um, many of you in the OR community will obviously be very familiar with the model, which distinguishes three different categories of people in a population, those who are susceptible, those who are infected, and those who are either recovered or removed from the system because they, they have uh, died. And just with those three categories and representation of how people move from one category to another, um, one is able to capture a very, very wide and interesting range of growth um, dynamics that could come out of the pandemic, including those where the um, aggregate dynamics can lead to an outcome in which um, the number of people who ultimately become infected is just a very small proportion of the total population. So that basic model, I think, provides very useful insights into aggregate pandemic growth dynamics and is the sense in which I think one can say that the development over time of a pandemic is something that's really relatively well understood and can be explored quite well and can be broken into further more detailed categories in order to get greater precision and accuracy in what's going on. Um, and indeed, I've seen in the program so far, there are many, many uh, different simulators that will be presented here in the, uh, in the conference, which will be worth looking at. So the very final point in here was just to say that um, the one area where it feels to me that the simulations are um, less obvious, what will happen over time, is if you need to put some kind of economic overlay on the model. We don't really have that many models which look at the interaction between the pandemic and, um, and uh, the economy. And that's the area where I think there's a great deal of uh, additional thinking to be done. So I will leave it at that and over back to you, Martin. No, oh, thank you very much to everybody. Apologies, John, for the move on the concept of metaphorical. I, yeah, I think I, I missed that. Usually when you copy a slice from one side to the other, you have this sort of, of problem. Apologies. So thank you very much to all the panelists. They have been great. I think the, the three presentations raised a lot of questions and issues. And I'm going through the questions as they were generated. Hopefully uh, we may be able to answer most of them. So the first question is for George is, what is the relationship of assumptions to scenarios? Ian Mitchell asked. You are on mute, George. Yeah. yeah. What's the relationship of what to what? Of assumptions to a scenarios. Uh, well, I'm not really sure what the question means. Uh, well, if you mean assumptions about the future, you know, the, I, I, guess. I, I think may, may be related mostly to, to the issue of biases uh, and that, that people bring to oh, us. Um, well, 
the scenario approach uh, is, of course, based on human judgment and judgment about, you know, uh, what's uncertain about the future, you know, uh, what's predetermined, what's a trend, etc. There's something like climate change, for instance. Some people say, well, it's predetermined. It's going to be part of all the futures. So it's a, uh, you know, something that's a predetermined element of every scenario. Or some people would say, well, my judgment is actually, you know, uh, climate change is uncertain. You know, maybe it's we're not sure whether it's going to happen or not, and all this sort of stuff. So it's all, and somebody may be right, somebody may be wrong. We don't know. It's it's a judgment. And scenarios are all about judgment. We're not sure if, if one judgment's better than another. And, you know, a lot of work in behavioral decision making, as it's called, has shown that judgments can be poor and judgments can be biased. You know, there are heuristics. This is the Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky work show that people use heuristics to make their judgments. And these judgments can be biased. And so, of course, the scenarios, therefore, or a best guess future, more importantly, can be wrong as well or biased. So scenarios get around this approach, get around this by having a range of futures, by using a, a range of heterogeneous sample of scenario team members to help build the scenarios. And therefore, there will be biases, etc. But at least you're thinking about a range of futures rather than a best guess future that might be uh, biased because the heuristics used to, to build it uh, may be flawed. Thank you, George. I have a question for James. It's um... Here is Kivan Hosseini. It's a COVID-19 pandemic revealed many sectors in human economy are very unresilient. How this, how scenarios can contribute to a more resilient future? Um, well, specifically in relation to the anti-fragile uh, yes. scenario approach, which I mentioned in my presentation, that's all about resilience or robustness. Although, interestingly enough, Taleb thinks that robustness and anti-fragility don't mean the same thing because anti-fragility anti means not that you, not just that you withstand variance, but that you actually gain from it. But um, it, it helps you to prepare scenarios beyond the anti-fragile approach and including the anti-fragile approach. They help you to prepare for the future by putting in place uh, plans for alternatives other than business as usual futures. But I, I noticed just to just to kill two birds with one stone, I notice in in one of the other questions, which was aimed at me further down by Ian Mitchell, yeah. this raises the very interesting question about how do you measure and value robustness? And if I might paraphrase, it raises the question: how do you value um, preparation for futures that then don't transpire? because most of the time these scenarios won't transpire, they won't happen. Most of the time business as usual will happen. That's why it's called business as usual. And that's a very, that's a very interesting area of research. Jan Quakel from Delft University is doing a lot of research on that subject. How do you evaluate and put a price on robustness in decision making? Because all of the main, all of the main techniques at the moment are about optimization. Um, so, you know, you, and you 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 would use probabilistic means to 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 decide what the 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 value of a particular approach is, the value of a particular strategy or a particular future. Um, whereas when you're trying to spread your bets over a wide range of futures, you need a different approach that isn't based on optimization that allows you to capture the value associated with being prepared for futures that then don't happen. And of course, we all know in a business or in government, if you spend lots of money on futures that then don't happen, you're going to get criticised as a manager or a policymaker. Yeah, thank you for that answer. I think I, I will jump onto that answer with something that perhaps John can, can answer. And I remember this paper from John Sterman is nobody gets credit for solving the problems that will never occur. So sometimes, so somehow if you, if you have a model that identify all these problems from a sort of very um, uncertain situation and you are prepared and you solve the problem before it happens, <laughs> they will say, why you, you, you did that? So perhaps, John, you, you can expand a little bit about that, creating that resiliency. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think the answer to that lies really in, in seeing how 
simulators can be used in the same way that narrative scenarios are created. In other words, you, you have a simulator that gives you some insight into an unfolding future. Now, you know, this may or may not come to happen, but if you have a way of packaging it, the insight and taking it around an organization, that's the crucial step in scenario work of preparing people to think about alternative futures so they are prepared to act um, in an appropriate way if, if that future were to unfold. And, and so that's, I think, where the you know, value of models and simulators would be, as the same thing, I think, with vivid narratives too, that just getting people's minds prepared for these futures so they're able to act in an effective and timely way when a particular future does unfold. Thank you. I'm, I'm conscious that in two minutes, three minutes, we will be um, um, kicked out of the of Zoom meeting. So I have a final question that um, I think everybody talked about, and it's I want a short answer for, from each of you from your perspective. And this was a very interesting question is, who are the most critical stakeholders in this situation for making a scenarios? George, can you start? Who will be the most critical stakeholder? I think the, the key is that these are the ones that are not involved in all these, you know, mass production of COVID scenarios. These are the people who are affected, uh, the people who can take action, perhaps are the people who are powerless, but uh, need to think about the scenario so they can uh, activate, so they can identify and activate a scenario, some stakeholders that could help them achieve the future that they want. So the key then, I think, is to is, is the stakeholders who uh, are powerless, perhaps. James? I would answer it in a very uh, simple inverse way by saying not people who own businesses. <laughs> okay, that's a good answer. John? I think, you know, all of us as members of society are, are the, you know, we are the ones who need to be prepared to act. And it has actually been very difficult to get people to change what they've been doing. Um, and, and so it's that ability to communicate to large numbers of people in the population, which I think is what some of the, the simulators have been able to do to some extent to raise awareness of these sorts of issues. So the population at large and politicians, some politicians, uh, particularly. Excellent, yeah, excellent. Thank you very much, all of you, for the very insightful presentation. I think it's a vivid example of how diverse and interesting is the scenario field. I'm, I'm conscious that I couldn't answer all the questions, um, but I think we are going to close in, in one minute. So thank you very much. And I hope you, you keep that with, with the other colleagues in, in the, in the Q&A. Um, thank you very much. And thank you.